Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. You know, the last few weeks we've been talking a lot about the top teams, the teams that look like they're headed for the playoffs. But what about the teams that have been disappointing, Tom? Well, it's hard to talk about them. Like San Francisco, they've won three times. Brody might retire, but they can't run the ball this year, can they? they well, they have trouble with running the ball. They have had for the last few years. They've been living with the pass, but they've been playing good defense in years before. Now that seems to be disintegrating, too. Well, Dick Nola must be very disappointed. I'm sure he is. And how about San Diego with a record of 1-6-1? and one? Well, Swedes have already surrounded himself with some real interesting people, I can say <laughs> it that yeah. way. And, and I really think they just have too many people pulling in different directions. They have a lot of talent out there. Yeah, I guess they do. Uh, there's some question about what Ron Waller, the new coach, is going to be able to do with all that talent. If he can put it together, that's going to be a major accomplishment, I think. But this is a week of a lot of great action. Oakland's big win over the Giants and Kansas City 19 to nothing over San Diego. New Orleans shut out Buffalo 13 to nothing. And Atlanta, they knocked off the Rams and you worked that game, what, 15-13? 15-13, they played good defense and Nick Mickemeyer hit all five field goals that he tried. Of course, we'll have all the rest of last Sunday's action too. What about our featured performer of the week, Tom? Later in the show, we'll see the man who made Atlanta fans happy and that would be young Nick Mickamare, who kicked five field goals and five tries to beat the Rams. But our featured performers of the week in the West are the entire Oakland Raiders defense. This footage is from last year, but if anything, uh, that Oakland defense has improved since then. The 11 angry men. They shut out the Giants last week, 42 zip, and that means Ronnie Johnson didn't get much. He just had 22 uh, yards and 14 carries. Randy Johnson, who threw so well against St. Louis the week before, was two out of 12 for 15 yards with two interceptions. And Bob Tucker, for the first time in a long time, didn't even catch a pass. I guess Big Red Alex Webster, the coach, said it pretty graphically and emphatically when he said, they beat us up physically. And that had to be a long trip back east to New York for the Giants. The Raiders, 11 angry men. In all of professional football, there's only one unbeaten, untied team. That's the Minnesota Vikings, who are off to their best start in their 13-year history. In Minnesota, the powerful Vikings met Cleveland, the AFC's number one defensive team. On the opening kickoff, the first break of the game went to the Browns when veteran Bill Brown bobbled, then rookie Brent McClanahan, number 33, fumbled the ball to the 19. Cleveland had a golden opportunity, but came away with only three points because of the Vikings' ferocious defense. Mike Phipps felt purple pressure all day as the Browns never came close to scoring again. Interceptions by two linebackers were the big plays of the game for Minnesota. The first was by number 58, Wally Hilgenberg, the steady 10-year veteran. The second was made by rapidly rising sophomore star Jeff Seaman, number 50. Though besieged by flu viruses, the Browns' defense played extremely tough also. it was still a ball game. Three field goals to one. Then on the first series of the second half, Don Cockroft gambled on fourth and two and lost. This was the play that turned the tide toward Minnesota as a fine screen pass from Fran Tarkenton to Ed Marinaro set up the game's first touchdown.
In the fourth quarter, the passing of Tarkenton and the receiving of tight end Stu Voigt put the game away for the Vikings. Minnesota's burial of the Browns not only preserve their exclusive unbeaten status in the NFL, but balloon their lead in the usually competitive NFC Central to an impressive four games. And so, Patrick, Bud Grant's Vikings just keep rolling along. And this week they play Detroit, a team they've already beaten 11 times in a row, but that sounds easier than it might be, Pat. Sounds easy on paper, Tom, but the way the Lions played last week against San Francisco, the stage just might be set for an upset. It didn't take long for John Brody to set the tone for an extraordinary game. Lim Barney's interception set up the game's first score, which was provided by number 19, Bill Munson, who was starting his first game in three years. Larry Walton's touchdown gave the Lions a quick lead, and it was not long before the pattern repeated itself a little later in the first quarter. Mike Wieger's interception once again set the stage for Bill Munson and Larry Walton. Walton's second touchdown gave Detroit a 14-0 lead after one quarter, and it was becoming obvious that this was not going to be one of those conservative, get to the 30 and kick a field goal type of games. Down by 14, John Brody finally began to connect with some of the guys in the white shirt. Although well covered, Ted Qualick pulled in a 46-yarder, on the next play, Gene Washington, also well covered, showed that he's returned from his ankle problems of recent weeks. The 49ers defense could not stop Billy Munson's offense, as Charlie Sanders supplied another big play. Sanders' long catch and carry set things up for the previous week's hero, Alty Taylor, number 42. Taylor's touchdown again at the Lions ahead by 14. But John Brody, who had thrown only one touchdown pass before last Sunday, threw his second of the day. This time to Ted Qualick and a wild first half inning with a score, San Francisco 20, Detroit 24. Unfortunately for the 49ers, the second half began suspiciously, like the first half. Lynn Barney's second interception set up a field goal and a seven-point lead. But then the horror show continued for John Brody. Forty-seven times, John Brody put the ball in the air. Twenty-nine times it was caught, but six of those were captured by the ball-hawking Lion defense. Perhaps the easiest was by rookie cornerback Levi Johnson, number 23, his fifth of the season. John Brody said later, the ball just never did feel good. I've had some pretty bad days, and this was one of them. Charlie Weaver's second interception was a Lions six, and the one which finally sealed the verdict at Detroit 30, 
San Francisco 20. In 1966, the Bears and Packers started a trend which showed the Pack winning four, losing one, winning four, and losing one. At the start of last Sunday's game, the Packers had won the four previous games, and there was never any doubt about whose turn it was. From the start, the Bears put the Pack on its back. True, Green Bay generated some offense early in the game, most notably this 84-yard kickoff return by number 48, Ken Ellis. In all, the Packers squeezed 17 points out of the 98 yards in total offense they mustered. An impressive feat when you consider a minus 12 yards passing. MacArthur Lane and John Brockington were the primary reasons for the at least representative showing. The greater part of the afternoon was completely dominated by Chicago, however, as Ike Hill took the first punt and weaved it back 72 yards. But there couldn't have been a more dominant figure than Bobby Douglas. The much maligned signal caller threw 10 for 15, had 100 yards rushing, and scored four touchdowns. He started things off with an easy connection to a tough running Craig Cotton. With freezing temperatures, Douglas kept ball handling to a minimum, especially when it counted. While he's certainly not the best quarterback around, he's a mighty good athlete. And last Sunday, at least, that was good enough for 337 yards of offense. By the end of the afternoon, Douglas had personally run through, over, and around the Packers, sending them to their third straight defeat while lifting the Bears to their third victory in eight starts. Both the St. Louis Cardinals and the Denver Broncos have come a long way toward redefining their images in the NFL this season, Tom. Well, that's true, Pat. And last Sunday, the two high-scoring clubs discovered just how close they are to one another. Both defenses were warming up with the pass in mind last Sunday, and from the start, Jim Hart continued Denver's backpedaling practice. Johnny Anderson was the receiver, and in the first quarter, Hart was hot. Hitting six of nine, including this four-yarder to Don Shy for the early lead. Just before the half, former Cardinal quarterback Charlie Johnson evened things up with a toss to tight end Riley Odoms. At the start of the fourth quarter, Charlie Johnson brought Denver to the St. Louis three-yard line on this courageous catch by Haven Moses.
Lloyd Little busted his way in, and Denver moved into a tenuous 14-10 lead. Jim Hart pulled it all together on the next series, and after this pass to Jackie Smith, the Cardinals were perched on the Bronco goal. From there, Donnie Anderson launched himself into the Denver end zone, and the Cardinals had themselves a 17 to 14 come from behind victory. But the Bronco bust wasn't going to be that easy last Sunday, as Jim Hart found out. Billy Thompson came down with the ball, and Denver had themselves a reprieve in Cardinal territory. Once again, Johnson looked to his big tight end, and Mr. Odoms helped get his teammates to the St. Louis three-yard line. That was as far as they could get, however, as the mean red machine ground them to a halt. It was some stand for the generally porous Cardinal defense, and with only four seconds on the board, a Bronco tie once again rested on the kicking toe of number 15, Jim Turner. Although the 32-year-old specialist had missed three field goals during the game, the 12-yarder was a cinch, and the two teams had themselves a hard-to-stomach 17-17 stalemate. While the Kansas City Chiefs defense has shown some consistency this season, their offense has not. However, against the San Diego Chargers last Sunday, both offense and defense came together. And for the Chargers, it was more than they could really handle. A familiar face to veteran Chief players last Sunday was that of Mike Garrett. Since coming to the Chargers from the Chiefs, the former Heisman Trophy winner has added seven footballs to his trophy case. All of them touchdowns he has scored against his former teammates. However, today, no more footballs would be added to his collection. With Garrett stopped, rookie Dan Fouts attempted to throw. Even when given time, Fouts found an alert chief defense ready to capitalize on the slightest mistake. Jim Kearney's interception was the first of three chief thefts, all halting late game drives. Looking to produce an offensive attack, the Chiefs called on Mike Livingston to replace an injured Lenny Dawson. The veteran backup man showed he was ready to get off the bench. Andy Hamilton took in this Livingston pass, one of 10 completions the veteran signal caller from SMU would throw for the afternoon. With 169 passing yards, Livingston led the Chiefs to 357 yards in total offense, including this touchdown to Morris Stroud. But the biggest problem for the Chiefs this season has been a non-existent running attack. Injuries on the front wall have forced substitutions, but against the Chargers, Chief runners started to roll. Number 38, Wendell Hayes, got the call 13 times, responding with 90 yards. Two Jan Stinnerud field goals and a five-yard jaunt around left end by Ed Podolak rounded out the 19-0 Kansas City win over the hapless San Diego Chargers. The New York Giants took the advice of Horace Greeley last week, Pat, and all those young men went out west. And the Raiders were more than glad to welcome a team that's in danger of taking up where the Houston Oilers left off. It was the first meeting ever between the Giants and Raiders, and in the golden west of the Oakland Alameda Stadium, the silver and black rolled out the welcome mat. 
Then they pulled the mat from under the New Yorkers as Clarence Davis opened the scoring floodgate on this five-yard touchdown run behind number 63, Gene Upshaw's block. The Oakland defense came in crushing waves and completely scattered the Randy Johnson-led giant offense. Then Kenny the Snake Stabler lofted Oakland's touchdown number two of the day to his tight end Bob Moore. When New York got the ball again, Johnson threw the first of four giant misdirected passes. Oakland's Namaya Wilson picked this one off and was only stopped from scoring by Johnson himself. Marv Hubbard finally took it in for Oakland on an eight-yard cruncher that brought the Giants down to size. When number 23, Charlie Smith, came in with a play, he quickly cut the Giants off at the knees as he made a bobbling catch to bring the score 28 to nothing. The silver and black marauders continued to plunder the ball as Gerald Irons stole this pass, which in turn led to another Marv Hubbard blockbuster. Norm Snead replaced Johnson as New York's quarterback, and his offense was quickly welcomed to hard times. was pulverized on the ground and hounded in the air as number 43 George Atkinson tracked his pass down and put the rampant Raiders in the goal position one last time. And then for old time's sake, Darrell LaMonica lofted a buzz bomb to number 89 Steve Sweeney which proved in this instance that East was East, but West was best by a score of 42 to nothing. We'll be right back with the second half of this week in pro football following station identification. With 18 consecutive losses, the Houston Oilers, with another loss, could have found themselves deeper in the record book as they traveled to Baltimore to battle the Colts last week, Pat. True, Tom, but believing that all bad things must eventually come to an end, the Oilers called on reserve quarterback Lynn Dickey to halt the Houston assault on the least desired record of them all. There has been no turning point for either ball club this season, as both squads have suffered from the outset. And as Baltimore won the toss and elected to receive, it was to be their only victory for the day. Marty Domery started out lofting a 40-yard rainbow to Raymond Chester, setting up a cold field goal. Lynn Dickey, starting his first game in two years for Houston, made an impressive debut. Dickey rifled a spiral to Billy Parks, who split zone coverage for the catch and score. The Oiler defense followed the offensive aerial show as Guy Roberts made a leaping interception of a Domri's pass. Six plays later, Bob Gresham barreled over, giving the Oilers a 14-3 lead. Mistakes became a habit for the Colts, and the Oilers were quick to take advantage. Ron Lou's recovery set up a Lynn Dickey to Mac Alston pass for a 21-3 lead. The 
The Oiler defense rose to stop a late first half rally as Greg Sampson pressured Domries, allowing John Matusak to sack the Colts signal caller, preserving the Houston lead at half. The Houston momentum carried over as the second half began. However, with a bounce of the ball, the tide changed in a hurry. Stan White's interception and return for the touchdown brought the Colts back into the game, setting the stage for a furious Baltimore rally. On the following series, Fred Willis fumbled the lateral, which number 83, Ted Hendricks, recovered. Hendricks' jaunt was called back, as you can't advance a lateral. However, six plays later, Domers threw to tight end John Andrews for the score. A one-yard Domers sneak climaxed a nine-play drive. The big game coming on a 36-yard shot to Glenn Dowdy. Tied up at 24 apiece, the Colts maneuvered into field goal range on a 47-yard pass to Cotton Spire. Baltimore owned a 27-24 lead with less than two minutes remaining. But on five straight passes, Dickey moved the Oilers into striking distance. This for Ken Burrow to the Colt 13. Dickey then pumped left and threw right, this time to Fred Willis on the screen. The other touchdown came with just 32 seconds remaining and gave Houston a hard-fought 31-27 victory over the Baltimore Colts. For Houston, the losing streak had ended at 18, and happy days were certainly here again. The New York Jets and Miami Dolphins closed out their series for this year in Windy Shea Stadium last week, Tom. It was really windy up there. Huh? Really bad. I'm sure the Jets were glad to see the last of their tormentors from the south, though, Pat, as they dropped their fifth straight game to Don Shula's world champions. With the Dolphins in town, future Jets prospects had little to cheer about. Quicksilver Mercury Morris opened the scoring on a 19-yarder the first time Miami had the ball. But quarterback Al Woodall led New York right back on a pass to number 83, Jerome Barkham. The pass led to a John Riggins score. With the game tied at seven, Riggins continued to pose a double threat as receiver and runner. His three-yard score up the middle put the Jets ahead, 14 to seven. But then the much praised Dolphin defense began to crack down. And while the defense got rough, so did the offense as Mercury ran into some unexpected interference. Both parties emerged unhurt, and the Miami Lightning bolt went on to further collisions, this time in the Jets' end zone at the end of a four-yard score punctuated by an all-star spike. Then Bob Greasy lofted a wind-hampered floater that Paul Warfield had to come back on. The tricky maneuver crossed up the defender, Warfield pranced in for the score. Down 24 to 14, Woodall tried to come back. He hit little Eddie Bell, who figured the effort was worth a little bell ringing of his own. But in the end, the Dolphins defense blanketed Woodall's receivers and pressured him out of the pocket where he became fair game in a losing game as the Dolphins chalked up the win, number seven, 24 to 14.
Coming off a commanding upset of the Washington Redskins, the New Orleans Saints found yet another challenge as O.J. Simpson led his Buffalo Bills into Tulane Stadium last week to test the rapidly improving Saints. Was the upset of Washington a fluke, or were the Saints for real? That was the question as the Buffalo Bills took the field against the high-flying Saints. The New Orleans defense began answering the question early, holding O.J. Simpson to just 30 first-half yards. However, the early St. Offensive show looked like the New Orleans of old. Bill McClard fell victim to the early St. Misfortune as a 47-yarder had plenty of distance but struck the goal post and bounded away. Finally, the Saints started making like the new club they're made out to be as Archie Manning fired complete to Bob Newland. Manning kept the Saints moving, eating up the clock in the first half, both in the air and on the ground. Two field goals and a nine-yard pass to Newland gave New Orleans a 13-0 halftime advantage. The Buffalo defense came alive in the second half as number 85, Walt Patilski, led the assault on Manning. While the fumble was recovered by New Orleans, the drive had been stopped, allowing the Bills to call on one of their least heard of runners, quarterback Joe Ferguson. Ferguson's gallop led to a fourth quarter gamble. With fourth and one at the St. 11 yard line, Jim Merlo, Joe Owens, and Derlin Moore combined to stop O.J. Short. Number 78, Billy Newsom's spike sealed the Buffalo threat. Forced to throw late in the fourth quarter, Ferguson found Bob Chandler, but number 30, Ernie Jackson, found him. After holding O.J. Simpson to 79 yards, New Orleans put the finishing touches on quarterback Ferguson, and the Saints seemed for real while posting the first shutout in the team's history, 13 to nothing. After losing 40 to nothing three weeks ago, these darn Saints have given up just three points in two games. Pat, now how the heck can you figure that? Can't figure it. The only team that may be harder to figure, though, is the Atlanta Falcons. After giving up 62 points in just two weeks, they haven't allowed more than one touchdown in any of their last four games. Half a season ago, when the Rams met the Falcons, Los Angeles won 31 to nothing. Last week, the Falcons needed to turn things around, and that they did. Trailing 10 to nothing in the first quarter, the turnabout was started by strong safety Ray Brown, number 34. Neither of the NFC's two top-rated passers had a great day, but Bob Lee definitely had a better one than John Hadle, and it pays to have a little luck, too. Three times in the first half, Lee set up field goals for rookie place kicker Nick Mickemeyer. And three times, the Hungarian-born booter connected, cutting the Ram advantage to 10-9 at the half. In the fourth quarter, Bob Lee turned to Dave Hampton for the game-breaker. An offensive interference penalty forced Atlanta to settle for another field goal, but Bob Lee kept the Falcons coming.
With less than a minute to play, Mickemeyer lined up at the 26 for his fifth and final attempt of the day. The 10th round draft pick from Temple had hit five for five and had scored all his team's points in perhaps the most important victory in Falcon history. For the first time ever, the Falcons had won four in a row and they still had not lost with Bob Lee at quarterback. For the Rams, their three game lead had been cut to one and suddenly there was at least a suspicion of doubt. Mike McCormick and the Philadelphia fans continued their love affair at Veterans Stadium last Sunday as the Young Eagles beat both the Patriots and the clock in a real hair raiser. The underdog Patriots struck early on a Jim Plunkett touchdown pass to rookie Darrell Stingley. Trailing 10 to nothing, the Eagles' Roman Gabriel was intercepted by Ron Bolton who raced 56 yards to the 19. On their first play of the third quarter, Plunkett went to Stingley again, and the first round draft pick made an incredible touchdown catch look almost routine. Stingley's touchdown gave New England a 17 to nothing lead. And instead of plunging forward, Roman Gabriel and the Eagles fell backwards until Norm Bulash, number 36, pointed them in the right direction. Bulash's play saved the Eagles from a safety, and then Gabriel struck for six with a lob to unattended Charlie Young. On the day, the rookie tight end made eight catches for over 100 yards, and many of those yards were gained by lugging the Patriot team along with him. Young's second touchdown catch was spectacular and brought the Eagles closer to New England 17 to 14. The bubble burst on the Patriots when a high snap flew over Bruce Barnes' head and was recovered by Will Wynn, number 71, another big play Eagle rookie. shrugged off Barnes and sped to the third Eagle touchdown in five minutes. Wynn's score gave Philadelphia a 21 to 17 lead. But the winds of change proved fickle when New England regained the upper hand on a touchdown by Sam Cunningham. When the extra point try was blocked, the score stood 23-21 with five minutes remaining. Field goal could win it for Philadelphia. The Eagles drove from their 20-yard line inside the Patriot 10 with 38 seconds remaining. And fourth down on the five-yard line, Tom Dempsey booted the birds to a 24-23 victory. It was redemption for Tom Dempsey, who missed a similar kick against the Bills. For Mike McCormick, it was his third win as a rookie coach and a sixth game where his team's fate was decided in the final minute. 
It's enough to give a good man a few more gray hairs. The way the Eagles are playing, Tom, it's not surprising that the Cowboys lost to them week before last. Against Cincinnati, Pat, Dallas was doubly motivated. First, they had to win to stay close to Washington, and second, the Cowboys had never lost to a team in the AFC in the regular season. The D in Dallas meant defense this week, and Doomsday dropped in frequently on Ken Anderson. By far the most intimidating Dallas defender was linebacker Leroy Jordan, number 55, who ranged from sideline to sideline, smacking Bengal runners. Jordan scored the first Cowboy touchdown when he intercepted Anderson's pass and raced 31 yards to give Dallas a 10-0 lead. In the first quarter, Jordan intercepted passes on three consecutive Cincinnati series to set up an early rout of the Bengals. When Roger Staubach caught bullet Bob Hayes on the fly, Dallas built a 17-0 first quarter bulge. Staubach went to setback turned receiver Mike Montgomery in the second period. Montgomery beat the zone first to the outside and then he burned it across the middle for a touchdown. Montgomery's score gave Dallas a commanding 24-0 halftime pad. But in the third quarter, a field goal and a 50-yard Anderson bomb to rookie Isaac Curtis cut the lead to 14 points. The Doomsday defense cemented on their helmets and 190-pound cornerback Charlie Waters stuck it to 245-pound running back Booby Clark. Doomsday was rarely fooled. Watch number 52, Dave Edwards, and number 75, Jethro Pugh, move to the screen back. Without a receiver, Anderson was an easy feast for Larry Cole. Dallas rolled to a 31-10 advantage when Bronco-busting Walt Garrison rodeoed in for six. Perfect defensive play put the finishing touch on the Cincinnati Bengals. A blistering outside charge by number 67, Pat Tume, combined with a hard hit by Mel Renfro, gave defensive tackle Jethro Pugh a chance to showcase his moves. Pugh's run was converted into a Staubach to Billy Joe Dupree connection in the end zone as the Dallas Cowboys spiked the Cincinnati Bengals 38-10. All right, Pat, I'm putting the last half move on you. What about our fearless predictions? And you're 27-17, and I'm hanging 23-21. I want to be just as conservative as possible. I'm not taking any long shots here. Yeah, okay, what you about... You have to move to catch me. <laughs> How about the Falcons at Philadelphia? Now, you saw the Falcons last week. They look very good. They're a tough team to throw against. I'll pick them. Well, and Philadelphia has to throw to move it. Uh, I'm going to go with the Eagles for an upset because of playing in Philadelphia. Well, they're playing very well, and they seem to like this uh, stadium here to play in, too. Pittsburgh's at Oakland, and this ought to be a great football game. Young Joe Gilliam can throw, but uh, he throws it sometimes to other people. I'm going to go with the Oakland Raiders with Stabler to, to stay on top of Pittsburgh. Well, i got to agree with you here. I think Stabler is throwing the ball as well as anybody in the NFL right now, and they're giving him great protection, and he'll cut you up. 
The Chicago Bears at Kansas City. Well, if you're faint of heart, I wouldn't even go and watch that game or see it. That's going to be rough. The Bears against the Chiefs. Uh, I'm going to go with Chicago. They're playing very well. Bobby Douglas had a big day. Uh, I'll go with Kansas City. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire, and we'll see you next week. Brought to you by West Clocks, a division of General Time, a tally industries company. Promotional consideration provided by Best Western Motels. There are over 1,250 Best Western Motels located in more than 900 cities throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And by American Airlines, if the sun is shining there, chances are American flies there. From the Caribbean to California to the South Pacific, American Airlines to the good life. Program materials for this week in pro football travel via REA Air Express.